Friends and colleagues and distinguished guests, members of the media, uh, whether you're here in person or you're coming in via the webcast, good afternoon and welcome to the Brookings Institution. My name is John Allen and I'm the president here and we're very pleased to have you with us for our event which is co-hosted with our colleague institution, the Heritage Foundation, and it is entitled A Strategic Framework for Countering Terrorism and Targeted Violence. As the name suggests, we're hosting today the release of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's new counterterrorism strategic framework, as well as hosting our honored guest, the Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Kevin McAleena. He'll shortly provide his remarks, which will unveil this effort. Since its creation on 11 September, since after 11 September, in the dark and challenging days of 2001, DHS has been a critical platform for combating terrorism in all its horrific forms. Time and again, dedicated servants of the department working hand in hand with their peers throughout the U.S. government and the military have kept America safe from threats both foreign and domestic. And I'm proud to have served alongside many of them over the years as our commitment to national security remains steadfast to this day. The Department of Homeland Security is a bulwark of our freedom and our safety. The threat we're facing, however, has evolved, and adaptation is required. Rising to meet that challenge is the new strategic framework that we'll be discussing today, and ladies and gentlemen, it could not be more timely. All across America, the threat of domestic terrorism grows by the day. With anything from pro-extremist rallies to bomb threats to active shootings, Becoming, becoming common interventions in our media headlines and our daily routines. And this, of course, says nothing of the terrible epidemic of gun violence which we're experiencing as a nation today. Violence that takes the lives of thousands of innocent Americans each year. What's more, racially and ethnically motivated violence, in particular that inspired by white supremacists, the sources of which of this violence are antithetical to our shared and cherished values, this scourge is also on the rise. This reality has driven a wedge into already strained political, socioeconomic, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, and religious divides and has made our nation less fundamentally safe, less prosperous, and ultimately less free. The threat is clear and it is real. Thankfully, finding ways to combat all forms of terrorism and targeted violence is central to why we're gathered here today. This strategic framework on which the Secretary will comment briefly uh, is a product of the tireless work of DHS's colleagues and often was the result of consulting with a variety of outside experts as well to develop and hone the details. And some of those experts were our very own from Brookings and the Heritage Foundation. It's a serious document with serious goals and objectives and actions and well worth our time to read and to consider in detail. But let me also be clear in saying that it took vision to conceptualize and to develop this document. And I commend the department and in particular the acting secretary for taking a stand on these issues which grow with seriousness in seriousness every single day. So we've got a lot to do this afternoon. The Acting Secretary will soon come to the stage and provide some remarks about the framework. And once he's concluded, I'll join him for a very brief one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, here on the stage. And to help facilitate your questions following the Secretary's remarks, we'll be passing out note cards, uh, which our staff will collect and will produce uh, for me on the stage. It's a very short timeline, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to recognize that uh, our ability to take questions from the audience may be constrained by that timeline. As you fill out the cards, I'd ask you to put the name and the organization on the top and a question as opposed to something else, uh, and please write legibly. Uh, once we've concluded, the acting secretary will depart, and then we'll transition to a featured panel of very distinguished experts. Susan Hennessy, our senior fellow uh, at Brookings, and executive editor of the Lawfare will moderate the panel. Jim Carafano, who is vice president and E.W. Richardson fellow of the Heritage Foundation will be joining us. Seamus Hughes, the deputy director 
of the Program of Extremism at George Washington University Center for Cyber and Homeland Security. George Salim, Senior Vice President of Programs of the Anti-Defamation League, and Chad Wolf, the senior official performing the duties of the Under Secretary and Assistant Secretary for Homeland Security for Strategy, Plans, Analysis, and Risk. It is quite a lineup, and they're going to discuss amongst themselves with Susan moderating for about 45 minutes using the same note card system as I had described before. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Acting Secretary McAleenan to the stage. Thank you, General Allen, and thank you so much uh, to Brookings and Heritage for hosting us today. I really appreciate Dr. Carafano, your participation in the event uh, as well. Uh, it's an honor to be among such an impressive group of academics, public servants, and experts to lay out the Department of Homeland Security's new strategic framework for countering the evolving terrorism and targeted violence threats that we face today. Our department was created in the wake of the devastating 9-11 attacks charged with coordinating and unifying the nation's homeland security efforts. And our mission is multidimensional, built on the five pillars of prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. The origin story of the department is a key element of our nation's response to the September 11th attacks, and our founding was intended to improve the ability to defend against foreign terrorist organizations seeking to harm the American people. The Al-Qaeda organization, first and foremost, loomed for years after the 9-11 attacks as the homeland's most significant terrorism concern. Then, as now, our first priority was and is to defend the country against terrorism, to ensure that no terrorist has access to the homeland or can exploit our trade, travel, or immigration systems. This is the Department of Homeland Security's core charge. And as President Bush put it at the National Cathedral just three days after 9-11, the commitment of our fathers is now the calling of our time. I put that quote above my cubicle in November 2001 in the nascent Office of Anti-Terrorism in the former U.S. Customs Service as a reminder of our purpose while we worked to advance a compelling and new priority mission. It is a DHS calling that has been heeded by thousands and a mission that has been maintained with success for nearly two decades. It is who we are. As a department, we are aware that the threats to the homeland continue to evolve. Today, they have evolved beyond those foreign terrorist organizations to include emerging challenges with domestic terrorism and targeted violence here at home. Targeted violence refers to any incident of violence that implicates homeland security in which an attacker selects a particular target prior to the violent attack. We continue to see violent acts inspired by hateful ideologies across our nation. On April 27th of this year, a gunman opened fire at the Shabbat of Poway Synagogue in Poway, California, killing one and injuring three others. The anti-Semitism that motivated him was ignorant and cowardly, and this attack was just one in a string of acts of targeted violence our nation has recently seen. That was my third week as Acting Secretary, and the Department mobilized quickly to respond. We had recently commissioned the Office of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention to galvanize and integrate our diverse efforts to secure the nation and to pre help prepare communities all across the country, building off previous department efforts to address all forms of targeted violence that threaten our homeland, regardless of the ideologies or lack thereof animating them. As this office began coordinating prevention efforts across our broad department, it became apparent that we had more work to do. Given the events globally in Christchurch, New Zealand, and closer to home at the gathering of multiple congregations at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, as well as the burnings of African American churches in Louisiana in March and April, I requested a new subcommittee of our Homeland Security Advisory Council, co-chaired by General Allen and Paul Goldenberg, to explore how we could improve our efforts to secure faith-based organizations against targeted violence and domestic terrorism. And we began developing a strategic framework that would build on our success in the struggle against foreign terrorist organizations and incorporate lessons learned from those successes to develop an approach to address the evolving threats of today. As we are in the middle of these efforts, our nation was struck again, this time twice in the same weekend in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. With over 4,000 DHS professionals, agents and officers and their families living in El Paso, this attack hit very close to home for us. Six family members of DHS employees were killed, and one DHS professional was shopping in the Walmart at the time of the attack, and due to her training, was able to render life-saving aid to one of the victims. That attacker sought to kill Hispanics, and his online manifesto was rife with references to multiple hate-based ideologies. The majority 
of our El Paso team working to protect our nation, uphold the rule of law, and care for vulnerable migrants arriving at our border is Hispanic. These professionals are American patriots who work every day to protect what our nation of immigrants is all about. So we stood together alongside leaders from El Paso, the state of Texas, and Mexico, and addressed this attack with moral clarity. We said it was hate. We said it was domestic terrorism, that it had no place in our society, and reinforced and it reinforced our confidence in the focus of our strategy we have been developing for several months. As the President put it, in one voice, our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Our Department recognizes clearly and unambiguously that today's terrorism and targeted violence threats stem from both from enemies, foreign and domestic, or multiple ideologies, or in some cases, none at all. Some of the most serious threats we continue to confront today have been part of the Department's focus since its inception, like the ongoing threat from forced terrorist organizations. In coordination with our partners at the Department of Defense and across the intelligence community, the Department of Homeland Security has defended against the foreign terrorist threat for nearly two decades. We have developed sophisticated methods to target this threat, including a defense in depth approach to our homeland security. This posture pushes our borders outward, extends our zone of security, and ensures that we are aware of the movement of illicit actors long before they attempt to enter the United States. And as a result, we've been very successful at denying terrorist entry to the U.S. or through our travel systems. Today, the large majority of our encounters with foreign known or suspected terrorists occur well beyond our borders, and we coordinate with international partners to take operational actions. But foreign terrorist organizations and radical Islamic terrorists continue to plot against the United States. Continued vigilance and enhancement of our department's efforts to thwart them is crucial. ISIS and al-Qaeda remain the two most pressing, pressing radical Islamic terrorist threats to the homeland through their potential to direct plots and also to inspire homegrown violent extremism in their name. Homegrown violent extremists have conducted eight lethal terrorist attacks in the United States since 2014, claiming 83 lives. One demographic from the conflict in Syria and Iraq represents a critical concern for the United States and much of the world, foreign fighters. The Syria conflict attracted some 40,000 individuals from foreign countries as combatants. While many died on the battlefield, thousands have left the region returning to their home countries or often going to remote parts of the world where they can more easily plan or facilitate continued terrorist attacks. As the primary federal agency responsible for travel intelligence against all threats, it is critical that the department understand who these actors are prevent them from entering the United States and our partner nations, and protect our trade and immigration systems from their exploitation. We will continue to extend our reach beyond U.S. borders to detect these threats, improve our vetting capabilities, and to disrupt any illicit trade activity that funds terrorism, and improve and adapt our screening capabilities, among other efforts. However, the overall terrorism and targeted violence threat has evolved. Not only do we face serious threats from a greater number of disparate actors than at any time since 9-11, but we also see these actors exploiting modern communications and emerging technologies, including, for example, everything from social media to hack hacking activity to unmanned aircraft systems to facilitate, plan, and execute their attacks. Domestically, as we have seen in the attacks in Poway, El Paso, Pittsburgh, Charleston, and elsewhere, there is evidence of this growing number of threat actors who seek to attack the seams of our diverse and vibrant social fabric and incite our nation's most vulnerable populations, our youth, are disenfranchised and disaffected to violence against their fellow citizens. These individuals are motivated by various violent extremist ideologies, including those that can be described as racial, ethnic, anti-government, or anti-authority in orientation, including very concerningly and increasingly white supremacist violent extremism. Attackers often plan and carry out their acts of violence alone and with little apparent warning in ways that limit the effectiveness of traditional law enforcement investigation and disruption methods. Today, white supremacist extremism is one of the most potent ideologies driving acts of targeted violence in this country. The FBI has highlighted a 40% growth in these investigations. White supremacist violent extremism's outlook can generally be characterized by hatred for immigrants and ethnic minorities with a historic focus on the African American community. I would like to take this opportunity to be direct and unambiguous in addressing this major issue of our time. In our modern age, the continued menace of racially based violent extremism particularly white supremacist extremism, is an abhorrent affront to our nation, the struggle and unity of its diverse population, and the core values of both our society and our department. It has no place in the United States of America, and as the President has called us to do, we will work to defeat it. In this evolving threat environment, our department must double down on the successes of our traditional counterterrorism efforts, 
empowered by our unique authorities and operations in the international and border environments, while simultaneously expanding our focus to provide a coordinated approach in the prevention of terrorism and targeted violence, originating within our borders by extremists of all ideologies, and empowering whole of community efforts across the country. While the challenges facing our nation are great, the Department will continue to operate with clear eyes and urgency on the threats we face. As Acting Secretary, I consider it our duty and a moral imperative for the dedicated and talented workforce of the Department to help lead this effort. That is why today I'm pleased to announce the release of the Department of Homeland Security's Strategic Framework for Countering Terrorism and Targeted Violence, representing our vision and commitment to the American people to address the evolving terrorist and targeted violence threats. Rather than starting from whole cloth, this strategic framework acknowledges the Department's successes in the counterterrorism fight across intelligence, targeting, investigations, and operations, and seeks to apply many of these tools our Department has developed over the years to counter foreign threats and the lessons learned from those experiences to counter emerging threats within our borders. We will do this in a transparent manner to hold ourselves accountable to the American people and maintain our commitment to respect critically important privacy and civil liberties protections that are ensconced both in our Constitution and in the Department of Homeland Security's core values. Designed to amplify and execute the Trump Administration's 2018 National Strategy for Counterterrorism, the first strategy for counterterrorism in this nation to mention domestic terrorism, the strategic framework has four key goals. Understand the evolving terrorism and targeted violence threat environment and support partners in the Homeland Security enterprise through that specialized knowledge. Prevent terrorists and other hostile actors from entering the United States and deny them the opportunity to exploit the nation's trade, immigration, and domestic and international travel systems. Prevent terrorism and targeted violence here at home and enhance U.S. infrastructure protections and community preparedness. We will not become complacent in protecting the homeland from the foreign terrorist threat through this strategy. However, the vast and diverse skill sets within the Department allow us to employ a counterterrorism strategic framework that targets foreign and domestic actors with some of the same effective and flexible tools in concert with Americans' privacy and civil rights expectations and commitments. While driving forward and addressing the foreign terrorist threat, building on our foundation, we are also turning our attention to the growing and emerging threats within our borders. And first and foremost, that means that the Department's new strategic framework aggressively targets the threat of targeted violence in the United States. As we know well, these attacks have a broad impact on American citizens and our national climate. Not only do they take innocent lives, but they diminish citizens' perception of safety in communities and public spaces. These attacks pull at the civic seams of our diverse country, which is why enemies, foreign and domestic, seek to incite this type of violence within our borders. While other departments and agencies have separate and vital roles to play, this framework amplifies the lines of effort specific to the Department of Homeland Security in the domestic terrorism realm, which are prevention and protection. The Trump administration's national strategy for counterterrorism calls on the U.S. government to champion and institutionalize prevention and create a global prevention architecture with the help of civil society, private partners, and the technology industry. The Department of Homeland Security will do just that, pursuing a whole-of-community approach to prevention as the best way to protect at-risk individuals without infringing upon chair civil liberties. Individuals, families, private and nonprofit groups, faith-based organizations, and state, local, territorial, and tribal organizations are often in the best position to prevent an individual's mobilization to violence. In the strategic framework, our prevention efforts focus on empowering partners in state and local government, as well as the private sector, to enhance the security of citizens here at home. This approach serves as a powerful example of DHS's role as a communicator, coordinator, and enabler, responding to the national level crises across multiple jurisdictions and entities. To empower our state and local partners, we will enhance and expand our capabilities across the department to help ensure that they have the resources, personnel, training, and other assistance needed to intervene before an individual commits violent acts. These efforts, to be coordinated by our Office of Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention, but driven by our components in the field, include training community stakeholders, conducting threat and vulnerability assessments, active shooter exercises, partnering with state and local governments and nonprofit organizations to inform common risk factors to help prevent mobilization to violence and find those off-ramps and intervention opportunities, and sending department personnel to the field to assist state and local governments in establishing their own prevention programs. Second, we will provide them with the latest understanding of the threat from terrorism and targeted violence. The strategic framework introduces an annual State of the Homeland Threat Assessment that will provide current analysis and data on the state of the threat that the Homeland confronts, helping to inform all levels of government and the broader public. In addition, 
The U.S. Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center, or NTAC, plays a leading role in behavioral analysis and trainings, spreading threat, threat assessment models as they've been doing for more than two decades to stakeholders across the country, helping to identify individuals who may be mobilizing to violence. In their latest analytic report, Mass Attacks in Public Spaces, NTAC found that the vast majority of cases of mass attacks and targeted violence studied in 2018, families, friends, or bystanders had raised concerns about violent actors prior to them committing violence, providing an opportunity for intervention if we take a whole of community effort and provide the tools to state and locals that they need. We will also counter terrorist and violent extremist influence online by engaging our partners in the private sector. The private sector plays a very significant role in social resilience and has the ability to inform the public of the risks associated with the spread of violent extremist ideology. We will continue to support the efforts by tech companies, NGOs, and community partners to spread counter-messaging campaigns seeking to steer individuals away from messages of violence. It is clear to us that we must institutionalize and scale our prevention efforts because intervention can and will prevent tragedies. But because not all attacks can be prevented, we must simultaneously work to build our resilience and our ability to respond and recover when they do occur. Our nation's infrastructure and public spaces are high-value targets for terrorism and targeted violence, and we consider it a department responsibility to spread awareness across the threat environment, the private sector, and the public. Fortifying our communities against targeted attacks is within our control, and we are well positioned to promote preparedness in our partners. The department has a small protection mission handled by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which leads federal government efforts to mitigate the nation's uh, infrastructure and prevent vulnerabilities. CIS's Soft Target and Crowded Spaces Guide provides tools, resources, and training to key stakeholders to help prepare for and respond to active shooter events. Since the program's inception in 2011, there have been more than 300 workshops with nearly 40,000 participants and 930,000 successful completions of online training. It's imperative that we increase the number of communities prepared to perform their role in preventing and protecting against, mitigating or responding to, and recovering from these attacks. Preparedness is a shared responsibility, and we are calling for everyone's involvement, not just the government's. Recent studies and lessons learned from our foreign partners show us that prevention and protection rule tools work, and the first national-level strategic framework to apply these tools to both terrorism and targeted violence simultaneously is what we're offering today. As this strategic framework explicitly states, terrorism and targeted violence overlap as problems and therefore require a shared set of solutions. DHS is introducing new methods of creating a more comprehensive understanding of the challenge of terrorism and targeted violence both within and outside the federal government. Importantly, it explicitly recognizes the need to focus and protect our most vulnerable populations, particularly our youth. And it, as our department is always forward-looking, the strategic framework is designed to assess DHS's past and provide a guidepost to, the, to its future. It intentionally focuses on how emerging technology can exacerbate these threats, but also how technology can help provide solutions to counter them. The strategic framework is our formal recognition of the emerging threat of targeted violence in the United States. It makes clear that our whole of department is committed to addressing that threat, just as we are committed to addressing the threat posed by foreign terrorist organizations. At the same time, we intend for this framework to articulate a vision, a vision for how our nation will respond to the evolving threats we face. Our department has dedicated operators and personnel, some of whom in the audience, who will play a critical role in implementing the strategic framework with vigilance and integrity. But we will only be successful with an extensive whole-of-government approach and collaboration, dedicated resourcing from Congress, and the commitment of the American public. DHS will follow our strategic framework with a public action plan, explaining to the American people in greater detail how we intend to accomplish our goals. So I'll close with this. I've been with the Department of Homeland Security since its inception, joining a predecessor agency after 9-11, I have participated directly in the development of our efforts to prevent terrorists from accessing the homeland along with U.S. Customs and Border Protection and interagency colleagues, and I am well acquainted with the foreign terrorist threats to our homeland. At the same time, I have watched this threat evolve to what it is today uh, with targeted violence and domestic terrorism unfortunately taking increasing prominence. That's why I'm convinced that this expanded and balanced approach is necessary. We at DHS have committed our resources to addressing this threat that time is now to take additional steps, and there's already significant work underway. We look forward to collaboration and feedback from diverse stakeholders, including our outstanding panel, which you'll hear from shortly, uh, to enhance our action implementation. And I thank you for your time and attention today.
wonderful. All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, on a short timeline, so let me uh, quickly ask the first question, and then we'll get some up from the audience. Uh, very comprehensive uh, layout on the strategic framework, and uh, I, I think many folks here have heard of parts of this, but I don't know that they've ever heard of it all together. Right. So what, what's new? Uh, to recap, wh why the need for the strategic framework and what's new in this framework ultimately to the, that's to the benefit of the country? Well, I think it's very clear, given the types of attacks we're facing, the public response, the concern uh, nationally, that, that we need to do something compelling and urgent and, and very clear. Uh, coming from CBP and, and seeing how we could work, even though most of our actions were operational and, and directly uh, coordinated, uh, we, we could work through industry to, to do things like secure the global supply chain, uh, to help enhance security standards, to inform, to provide threat assessments, and provide guidance on steps that could be taken. Uh, looking across the department, understanding what CIS is doing, Secret Service, FEMA, Federal Protective Service, we have all these capabilities reaching out to communities around the country. We need to coordinate, integrate, and galvanize that effort and make sure that everyone understands the tools, resources available, and is focused on this problem, focused on getting in front of it and preventing pathways to violence, but also being prepared to respond effectively. Mr. Secretary, how do you feel uh, or how have you sensed the, the willingness of the private sector to step up? to be a partner with you in this. This is a critical issue. Yeah, I, I think they're very willing. Uh, and we're seeing the same thing from state and local communities, non-governmental organizations. As you know from your faith-based uh, work on the Homeland Security Advisory Task Force, uh, there's a lot of ownership uh, and willingness to partner. What they need is the tools. What, what, are, what threats are they, are they facing? What are the best practices to be ready for a potential act of targeted violence? You know, everything from, you know, evacuation plans uh, to, to understanding how to help a, a young person find a pathway off uh, that route to violence. Sure. I mean, those are the kind of things that we're seeing, a wide open partnership. Secret Service National Threat Assessment Center, uh, in their mass attacks in public spaces, they've done training for 12,000 people this calendar year alone. Mm. Mental health professionals, school resource officers, state and local government, that's the kind of engagement we're getting. We want to make sure we're wielding that without overlap and prioritizing on risk and making sure everyone knows the resources are available. A, a similar question on social media platforms. Right. Now, those are very powerful and they can work to our advantage, they can really work to our detriment. How are you finding that, that challenge? Yeah, so there's lots of thorny challenges that the strategy does not fully solve. Uh, and, and one of those is, is the conversation we have to have on the, the, the issues in the conversation uh, online that are, is unfortunately helping accelerate a pathway to violence. It's providing individuals that might be disaffected or angry with validation, uh, with, with the community uh, around their, their feelings. Uh, we have to understand without policing ideology or affecting speech, how we see that risk and how we can intervene uh, as a community in advance. And that's the issue of uh, balancing uh, free speech, privacy against uh, the hate that can be uh, promulgated and ultimately penetrate into exactly. society on these social platforms. Right. Mr. Secretary, where would you like to see, given this framework and the work of the department, the partnerships that you are creating, where do you want to see us in six months, 12 months, 18 months as a result of what's just happened today? Sure. Well, we've, we've developed an immediate surge uh, action plan, which I did not cover because then it would have been a very long set of remarks. It was already long. Uh, but we're going to implement that immediately. But beyond that, we are developing an action plan uh, that's going to provide that roadmap with specificity mm -hmm. on the interagency partnerships, on our expectations for the DHS components and their outreach to the whole of community efforts. But it's also going to probably result in some resource uh, implications. Uh, we have asked for an out-of-cycle budget increase uh, to support the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Office and that build-out, as well as some additional grants uh, for prevention of violence uh, out in the field. Uh, but we think we're probably going to need more to fully uh, realize this effort. But we do have a tremendous amount of capability, resources, and dedicated experts already on staff and providing this guidepost and how we want them to approach their mission. We think we're going to see immediate impact. That's terrific. And I'll ask for the cards now, if I could, please. Uh, I think it's Tom Warnke of the Atlanta Council. Thank you for the question. The question calls for more efforts and programs uh, to make it succeed. Do you know how much more this strategy framework will cost? 
Uh, and has the White House and Congress given you, the DHS, the, what you think will be the resources today and given you an indication of the willingness to give you the resources in the future? For right. Us? I, I may have What's just pre-answered that question uh, uh, on my last response. Uh, but the, the president, after El Paso, called for resource needs for the FBI, for other uh, domestic terrorism uh, efforts uh, across the interagency. And so we're assessing that right now. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking with the professionals at OMB and seeing what we need from Congress uh, to further support that effort. But again, with the Targeted Violence for Terrorism Prevention Office, with the efforts across DHS, from CISA to Secret Service, uh, to FPS, FEMA, our intelligence and analysis shop, and our operating components, we think we can make an impact right away. Um, you mentioned perceptions of safety. And of course, the department in last mass shootings has paid a personal price for this. How do you think Americans view in their current perception of safety? Is it a misperception or uh, a perception that uh, the, the department can help to inform with respect to how safe our population is? And that's a good question. I mean, we, we, don't, we see two things. We, we don't want people to be complacent that, that something can't happen here. We, all, we also don't want people to be scared uh, to go outside. Uh, and so what I think, the, and the President after El Paso, he said, we cannot afford to be uh, hopeless. Uh, we, we can't afford to, to sit... Uh, pat on, on our laurels. We have to take action. Uh, and what we're trying to do, uh, you know, from really across the department is empower citizens uh, to be resilient, to understand risk factors, to be able to identify them, to, to know how uh, to respond, right? There's not, all interventions are not created equal. That's right. uh, there, some require a law enforcement intervention, some are more of a conversation, some are a mental health or a family uh, support uh, effort uh, that's required. So we want to provide people the awareness uh, and the tools, uh, really, in that whole community effort. I mean, it, it's it's consistent across our counterterrorism mission, targeted violence, but it's also what we're trying to do with cyber and on foreign influence. And there is an important statement on on resilience against foreign influence uh, in this uh, strategy as well. Uh, you, you, I want to thank you for the very clear public statement on white supremacists, white supremacy, its hateful ideology. Uh, that is something all Americans need to hear about all the time because we're all victims of it, right. regardless of our origins. We're all victims of it, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, and the more our country uh, commits to that, uh, the safer we will be in the end. You talked about, uh, in the context of foreign influence and foreign terrorism, that the, the department has pushed its borders out. The country has pushed right. its borders out. Could you talk to us a little bit about the partnerships that you see overseas? What, what form does that take? I, I don't know necessarily that America... Is, uh, is well informed on that. Uh, we're safe right. in many respects because of that. What does that really mean? Sure. I mean, that, that's been, a, you know, really a multi-decade effort uh, across the interagency. Uh, UN Security Council uh, supports continued improvement in this area with the Resolution 2396. Uh, but DHS and, and really uh, CBP has been at the forefront of, of creating this capacity uh, internationally. Uh, this, these are things like uh, creating the ability to create a watch list, uh, to analyze passenger manifests, uh, to identify known threats, to, to collect biometrics uh, and create these interdictions and really have a shared visibility of potential movement of security or threat actors uh, and be able to coordinate on operational action. Uh, so it's something that we've been working closely with the Europeans uh, for, for years. They've taken a number of significant steps both in their law and in their operationalization of it over the last five years. We have a very good network in the Western Hemisphere uh, working on identifying threats heading toward our border, uh, especially from outside the hemisphere, and we're going to continue to build on that capacity. It's called for explicitly in the strategy. Uh, again, this is, this is not a shift uh, of DHS focus entirely. It's a balancing of DHS focus and really trying to build on the outstanding capabilities, techniques, and international partnerships we've already developed. And those are essential. They really do keep the border distant from our shores. That's really important. Uh, one, one more, more question. Uh, the report does identify multiple threats, um, but what will DHS actually do to prevent white nationalism and disinformation campaigns that support it? Are you forming any task forces or specific organizations uh, within the context of your ability to answer that that will be focused on that, uh, that threat and that challenge? Right. So a couple different answers. First, I want to emphasize Department of Justice and the FBI remain the primary investigative entity for domestic terrorism. DHS supports them extensively uh, as the largest uh, provider of 
of agents and intel analysts to the joint terrorism task forces all around the country. So that, I think that's the first part of that answer. Uh, but in, specifically, and again, the action plan is going to lay all of this out. What, what steps are we going to take? One is the engagement with the private sector. Uh, again, not policing ideology, right. uh, but the private sector has the ability, uh, as Cloudflare did in, in the immediate aftermath of the El Paso attack, uh, to, to make a decision to not support a, a website that's become a cesspool of hate, uh, for instance. Uh, that's the kind of decision making we want to see out there in the private sector. The task force uh, that you're working on, uh, how do we prevent and protect uh, violence against faith-based organizations and houses of worship? Uh, that has a direct correlation with sure. uh, getting out in front of a white supremacist extremist attack. Uh, so we're going to take a lot of specific steps through this strategy. Uh, one one I, I want to highlight in particular is the uh, State of the Homeland Threat Assessment. Uh, our Intelligence and Analysis uh, Directorate has dramatically increased their reporting on domestic terrorism, 150% increase last year, and a lot of those finished intelligence and tactical reports have involved white supremacist extremism. So we're pushing that out through our, our fusion centers all around the country. We have liaisons on sh in sheriff's offices and police departments, uh, and we're trying to get that information out that can help aid uh, state and local law enforcement to, to take effective action. Again, that's, that's where DHS is not the operational entity, uh, but we, we can support it. One last point. Sure. If we see uh, white supremacist extremist connections with international organizations, say in Europe or elsewhere, we already have ongoing investigations and National Targeting Center interdiction efforts uh, to prevent that collaboration and correlation internationally. Terrific. So with the uh, deployment of the, of the framework today, uh, are there one or two real seams or gaps in how we are postured today to protect our citizens that you'd like to see be closed by this? Yeah, I, I do think that conversation on the online uh, aspect is really important. And it's not one that DHS is going to own alone. Uh, that's a whole of society conversation or congressional uh, engagement. Uh, but, you know, it's become too easy uh, to get validation for your ideology, even if your ideology is shifting, and we are seeing that. Uh, the other concern that it provides is really an acceleration. Uh, the velocity of cases the FBI talks about uh, have increased dramatically from inspiration to action. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're thinking through how to get in front of that. Uh, and one final question. I know your time is very tight. You did talk about uh, the six uh, family members who were killed in the shootings and the, and the one family member who was able to make a difference at a critical moment. Yeah. Um, this is an easy question, I think, but I think Americans need to hear this as well, and that is tell us about the people that are part of your department. And I see a, a TSA, Transportation Security uh, uh, Administration uh, officer out in the audience. I, I see a Coast Guard officer at, out in the audience. It's a diverse organization of really dedicated people. Can you tell us a little bit about who's in this department, please? Sure. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would name them, but they prefer their anonymity because I see some folks out in the mm -hmm. audience who... You know, outside of maybe Troy Miller, our director of field operations in New York, have done uh, more than any other uh, people uh, in DHS to address the foreign terrorist threat and, and prevent uh, its access to, to the United States. But, uh, you know, the, the professionals we have at the Department of Homeland Security are a daily source of inspiration. Uh, they're, they're incredible. I was out with them on the Rado, Texas, in San Diego, California uh, earlier this week. Uh, co you know, completely different operational areas, but, but seeing how they're making improvements uh, to our border security. Uh, you know, it talks with one, I'll, I'll give you one more example. Uh, David Higgerson, uh, I'll name him. He is a Laredo uh, DFO. He's finishing his 49th year uh, in federal service. Uh, he's going to be retiring in about six weeks. Uh, and what he wanted to talk about was th the progress over the last five years and then the things that he was, you know, frustrated to have to leave unfinished. Uh, for instance, we're trying to, to build a port of the future where a truck never has to slow down if, as it crosses the border. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it can be scanned in motion. It can be targeted for risk, both the driver, the cargo, in an integrated fashion. Uh, and he wanted to see that realized. But he's not going to get that done before October 31st. But we have a lot of professionals who will maintain that effort. So uh, it's a tremendous group of people that continue to work every day to secure our, our country. And uh, it's an honor to, to work alongside them. Uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for deploying this important framework. Uh, we look forward to being a platform to help you continue to Improve it as time goes on, along in our, with our partnership with Heritage. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Secretary. General. Really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.